the Kingdom Mission, located inside a dilapidated theater in Harlem, New York City. Its preacher, Pastor John, leads his flock with gospel. In his sermons, he shares the price of walking through the gates of heaven, all your money. The Kingdom Mission is where private detective Harry Angel meets his client, Louis Cipher, who will hire him to find the elusive Johnny Favorite. We explore the secrets within the mission, including why it is so appealing to Mr. Cipher. Angel Heart was released in 1987, written and directed by Alan Parker, and based on the novel Falling Angel by William Jortsberg. The first image we see outside the mission is of a grieving crowd in mourning. Immediately, the mission is painted in a mood of chaos, or better put, distress and anxiety. When Angel steps inside and climbs the stairs, we see only a silhouette. His identity is obscured in a very film noir style. The light reveals him again, but it seems he appears he is stepping into a trap as he is surrounded by bars and gates. Angel pauses for a moment, combs his hair, and steps ahead. He immediately appears on a second floor balcony, looking below to Pastor John's sermon. While Angel climbs three steps outside, and by my account 14 inside, there seems to be a little play on spatial awareness. The room Angel looks down from the balcony seems too deep in comparison. Where else do we see staircases reminding us of an Escher painting? It's in the opening scene where steam rises from icy snow up into a world of stairs. The walls of the Harlem Mission pulpit is decorated in dark red, I would describe as blood red. Angel looks past an undecorated chandelier with a single bowl burnt out, a very subtle, almost subliminal message how distressed the mission is. Pastor John is unapologetically preaching about giving him money even so going so far to demand a Rolls Royce from his flock. On the surface, we get a feeling that the film is depicting religion that is less than flattering, but in fact, working to keep us off balance. If you can look past the comical absurdity of Pastor John's rather blunt ask for money, take notice how popular and effective he is, as cash is waved at his face. He's not even trying to be subtle. I think the curtains behind him is also a subliminal message. Is it really a street level window? Or a facade that makes it look like a window, but the pulpit is deep in the basement? Wine Sap introduces himself to Angel and gives likely the most weird and awkward handshake in cinema before being escorted to his client. Harry Angel can't help to notice a faceless woman in black scrubbing the walls from blood. Wine Sap explains the most unfortunate and unpleasant act from a husband of Pastor John's flock. The theme of a distressed mission continues. Angel enters the mission sanctum where he is introduced to Louis Cipher. Notice how Winesap obscures Cypher before stepping aside and revealing him like royalty. Cypher is seen sitting prominent in a chair propped on a raised platform with his cane swiveling back and forth. Cypher looks regal. Cypher asks Angel for his identification and though we do not see him flip through the plastic card holders, we do know Angel already poses in several different identities. Angel is asked about Johnny Liebling, spelled Lie Bling, and his stage name, Johnny Favorite. Harry Angel squirms and looks uneasy and defensive. Cypher and Winesap never explained how they found Harry Angel and why they chose him to find the elusive Johnny Favorite. For $50 a day, Angel takes up on their offer. 
after a second meeting with Cypher in an Italian cafe where Angel explains he couldn't find favorite but takes up on Cypher's offer to continue for $5,000. Angel returns to the Harlem mission. Neither the film nor the script gives an explicit explanation, but my belief, Angel is drawn to the room with the splattered blood. Walking through the vestry, he finds the door closed this time and a translucent window glowing red. However, the evidence in the room has been all cleaned up. To the audience, this is foreshadowing. However, to Harry Angel, it triggers memories of another window glowing red. The scene cuts to Pastor John's sanctum, where Harry Angel sits and stares at an empty royal chair, where a mysterious cabinet grabs his attention. He opens the cabinet and uncovers disturbing objects resembling black magic, including a mummified monkey, eyeballs, and voodoo dolls. His discovery is timed to the parading choir outside, singing, While Pastor John is outside, paraded like a king, we understand his true religion. Angel returns to the pulpit, having descended from another set of stairs, and comes across a mysterious stranger in black. It terribly piqued his curiosity. He is compelled to approach the figure. The script describes the figure in the shroud as a woman. However, I have a theory that will be explained in a later video. Angel never gets to see the shrouded figure as two heavies attack him. We only see the figure in black in one other cut. The figure is unmoved, oblivious to the events happening behind her. Angel escapes through the mission, as if it was a maze, including racing through staircases. Again, playing on spatial awareness. Perhaps he's not just escaping the mission, but a little version of hell. He jumps into Pastor John's vanity parade, and looks to give not just one, but four deliberate shoves into Pastor's bearers. This is also a message what Angel really feels about the pastor's religious beliefs. We see dogs again, and the first time pursuing Harry Angel before he escapes. Before we reveal a little known link between Louis Cipher and the mission, like, share, or subscribe if you enjoyed this video and want to see more content like this one. Ever wonder why Cipher wanted to meet Angel in Harlem? Or ask yourself why he helped himself to the pastor's throne with a glass of wine? The script tells Pastor John is a business associate of Louis Cipher, who obviously is helping the pastor in his efforts to raise money. The script also tells a story how Pastor John bought a hotel in Newark using only cash. Speaking to himself, Harry Angel calls out the racket the preacher is running when he sees the money flowing after a cheesy sermon. It puts his deliberate confrontation with the pastor in a clear perspective. Let me know in the comments below, what do you think of the Kingdom Mission? A friendly community resource for enlightenment? Or a small piece of the underworld with a heavy price of admission? This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, when a Cadillac won't do, True love means riding in a Rolls Royce. The Secrets of the Kingdom Mission was a video where I discussed cinematography, set design, and subliminal messaging. However, I left out many other clues, additional lore not mentioned. Angel Heart is notorious for its mysteries. It's near impossible to decipher them all on first viewing. Who is Johnny Favorite? Where is Johnny Favorite? Who is the woman in black? Was Harry supposed to show up at Margaret Cruzmark's place at 1.30 or 4.30? What makes up a Two Sisters cocktail? And no, I don't know the poem. Mysteries have stories played out in front of us. Sometimes, there are other stories, obscured, riddled with more questions than answers. You may find them in the script, the source material novel, but that doesn't help much. 
when you're watching on the big screen or on your phone. The Kingdom Mission is one of many examples of a story behind the story we'll discuss here. As always, the alternative theories mentioned within may cause anxiety, rage, and disbelief. But that's why you're here, I hope. Kindly consider leaving a like, share, or subscribe if you enjoy this video. Pastor John would approve. Uh-huh. Okay. No, I know the place. Have you wondered why Cypher chose to meet Harry Angel for the first time in Pastor John's mission? Did it seem odd that Cypher and his attorney sidekick, Winesap, invited themselves to the pastor's inner sanctum? Cypher took the throne and helped himself to some wine, as if it was his mission. Thrones are for royalty, after all. In the source material novel, Falling Angel by William Yortsberg, Angel first meets Cypher in a New York restaurant and without wine sap. The film gives us this later in an Italian cafe, soon after Dr. Fowler's demise. Why did Alan Parker chose to go with the mission? As a matter of storytelling, the answer to why is rather straightforward. It sets up the themes of religion. There is incongruity with the business-like formality upstairs, while the audacious sermon occurs downstairs. Parker's depiction of religion in Angel Heart comes with rituals, routines, and performances. Parker shoehorns images of a lady in black, cleaning up a messed up wall with help of a porcelain bowl. Winesap gives a terse explanation of this tragedy, and it's never mentioned again. However, the ladies in black and the bowls do make their reappearances. They were more important than the poor guy carried away. Yortsburg does mention a Harlem church, the New Temple of Hope, in his book. It is run by a Reverend Love. It comes in the middle of the novel and not the beginning. While Harry Angel did not meet person to person with Cypher in the temple, Harry did witness a performance there, given by Cypher under a pseudonym, L. Cipher. Cipher is introduced by the Reverend as his teacher and a very wise man of another faith. Cipher, a.k.a. Cipher, and the Reverend are associates. And Pastor John's quip about deserving a Rolls Royce And you want to give to me? Then I should be in a Rolls Royce! is likely a reference back to the novel, where Reverend Love chauffeured El Cipher around in his roles. But back to the film. New Temple of Hope becomes the kingdom mission. Reverend Love is now Pastor John, who wishes for a Rolls but rides around on a carried chair. What is inferred in the film and mentioned in a working draft of the script, that Pastor John is a business associate of Cypher's, as originally to be explained by Winesap. He and Cypher were guests of the pastor. So how does Pastor John benefit from Cypher's help? Money, of course. As explained by an in-script character, Siley, a newspaper vendor removed from the film, later explains to Harry that the pastor bought a hotel in Jersey in cash. He's swimming in it. What does Cypher get in return? Pastor John's soul, of course. The film tells its lore more abstractly. The pastor's true spiritual beliefs tucked in a hiding place. On first viewing, it may be interpreted as hypocrisy, putting up a false face. However, if you start linking John with making deals with the devil, we understand more Lucifer's ability to persuade others to sell their faith for the material, whether it's money or your favorite taxidermy. You must want this Johnny pretty bad, huh? I don't like messy accounts. Why does Harry Angel make a second trip to the Kingdom mission? Angel was all but bribed to stick with the investigation, and one scene later, he's off doing something else. The kicker here was he wasn't going to find Johnny Favorite there. He would find nothing to help with his investigation. Angel's visit to the Kingdom mission is a story told exclusively visually. In fact, there are many stories, each without a single word of exposition made inside. From scene to scene, we are given a preview of either the future or the past. 
Parker cleverly inserts a montage here of experiences, of clues seen later in waking dreams. All are conscious premonitions of what we'll see again in Angel's head. We can assume he was lured back because the bloodied wall triggered his curiosity. However, he sticks around helping himself to Pastor John's most sacred throne room. Then he makes his way to the pulpit, sees a vision of the lady in black before heavies jump him. If we take these one by one, we get an example of a translucent window in a porcelain bowl, each associated with the final sacrifice. Harry is staring at an empty chair perched on a stage. This is seen later as an electric chair in another vision. Angel later approaches the lady in black which may be an apparition or an oblivious follower. Let's not forget other lores, including that voodoo cabinet. This does at least two things, intermingles paganism or the occult in a place where you'd expect to see it the least. It also replaces Winesap's scripted explanation of the pastor's association with Cypher that will be re-examined in an epiphany, not that one, after Cypher's final reveal. Looking into the working draft of the script offers no insight. Harry's conversation with Cypher in the cafe is there. The visit to the Kingdom mission does follow. But Harry just shows up, like the film. There is no written explanation of why. He visits the room, now tied clean. Harry takes a look at the armchair pulpit, Instead of a cabinet, there are primitive paintings with themes of the occult he didn't notice on his first visit. Harry's final experience inside the mission was his encounter with the Lady in Black and the Heavies. I speculate there is one other reason for the repeat visit, and that inspiration comes from the source material. Angel went back to investigate Cypher, beginning with his known origins. When you eat boiled eggs like this, you're inviting questions. The novel had Angel shift his efforts from digging up Favor's history to Cypher's day-to-day -day activities. In the film, Angel's suspicion of Cypher comes out in the open, later, where they meet in a church in New Orleans, and Harry comes out and asks, rather obscenely, Who are you? Cypher didn't answer. An unfortunate husband, one of Pastor John's flock, took a gun to his head. Most unpleasant. Now we come to the most outrageous example of lunacy inside the Kingdom mission. For first time viewing, we may think the story's plot is first told to us upstairs, in the inner sanctum between Angel, Cypher, and Winesap. It's an easy assumption, because that is where the exposition, all the talking, happens. However, stories can be told by exposition, visually, or both. Whether we noticed or not, there was a story told visually before Harry met Cypher. Technically, it had started with Winesap outside the bloodied room. What were the visuals? The grieving woman, the sermon, the wall. On the surface, the grieving woman sets up unsettling feelings and distress. It's the first example of overt emotions and reflects the tone of the film. For those who've watched Angel Heart many times, take notice we are never told ahead of time Angel was headed for a church. He arrives in Harlem and bam, unhappy people holding hands. Inside comes the second visual, the sermon. Once again, the initial point this makes establishes where Harry is. He's inside a place that can be described as a church, a mission, or theater, depending on your point of view. The sermon is over the top, but in some ways more subtle than others. The theme of practicing spirituality begins here. So what have we learned so far? The grieving woman just stepped outside the building. Do we associate her with the mission we didn't know about yet? Well, your brain does. The third visual tells an awful backstory about the Kingdom mission. That's the wall of splattered blood. The theme of the woman in black is not yet established, 
This is foreshadowing without realizing it. The wall, the cleaning, the bowl, and the woman return later and more often. For first time viewing, it's to shock the audience, either to see a horrible image in a church or how casual everybody seems to act about it. It's incongruity. It's a contradiction. It's one thing that doesn't belong with the other. There is a story here. Winesap in the film tells some of it. A husband of one of Pastor John's flock took his life and was not a follower of the pastor's. But no, never mind. And everyone goes on their merry ways. If we revisit the images in chronological order as seen in the film, it appears as three different stories. But swap the images in chronological order in the film universe, and we see a different story. Husband splatters his blood on the wall. The widow visits the mission inside. They go ahead with the sermon anyway. This meant they brought in the lady in mourning while part of her husband's remains were being scrubbed off the wall. No sooner she stepped out the door, Pastor John began his money-grabbing stage show. This place is nuts. I wouldn't be surprised if she was pushed out. If you're wondering why the husband would be driven to do such a thing, you're only going to find the answer in the script. Winesap explains to Harry that Pastor John expects his flock to practice abstinence. Mind-blowing. This was the Kingdom Mission a place where you can worship glory or money. It's where anyone can make a deal with the devil if you say the right words. You can visit anytime, but you just can't stay. This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, you can buy a hotel, but that doesn't mean you get the car. The trail to finding Johnny Favorite takes Harry Angel to Coney Island in search of the fortune teller, Madame Zora. We examine the clues the scene gives us in its few short minutes. With the help of the script, we look into the differences and decode the mystery of Coney Island. Angel Heart was released in 1987, written and directed by Alan Parker, and based on the novel Falling Angel by William Jortsberg. After Harry Angel parks his car in front of the Penny Arcade, we are given a wide view of underneath the boardwalk. It is very desolate, there is garbage, there are rats feeding on scraps. It is not beautiful. Angel walks on the beach and meets Izzy. The script reads, Harry, silhouetted against the sea, walks towards a man sitting in a deck chair. Izzy, he is incongruously naked from the waist up, slim, sinewy, oblivious to the cold, a plastic nose shield clipped to his glasses. Izzy offers Angel one of his nose shields he found underneath the boardwalk before suggesting to Angel that he should speak to his wife if he wants to learn more about Johnny Favorite and Madame Zora. All we know about his wife, Bo, as named in the script, is that she is Baptist and is little on the heavy side. She stands knee-deep in the water and tells Angel Margaret Cruzmark was Madame Zora and closed her booth and returned down south. Bo then serenades a Johnny Favorite song. Let's first take a look at Izzy. When Harry asks him what he does in the summer, Izzy answers, he bites the head off of rats. When asked what he does in the winter, Izzy chuckles and answers the same. His identity is reflected in his choice of clothes. The top half represents the summer, the bottom half the winter. The moral of his character, what you see is what you get. There is only one Izzy. Compare him to Harry Angel who searches for Favorite and Cruzmark, each with their own aliases. Angel is asking about Madame Zora, who also is Margaret Cruzmark. He is also trying to find Johnny Favorite, also known as Johnny Liebling, and we all know where this will go. Izzy is genuine. Harry is not. This is accentuated with the nose shield. We see two versions of Harry in one scene, with and without it. It's not a coincidence that Izzy talks about the boardwalk and rats after we get a close and personal look at them both. There can be a few interpretations that explains why underneath the boardwalk is so important. It may show the true ugliness, the cost of demonstrating a facade of amusement and excitement above. 
perhaps is an analogy of Johnny Favorite's price of fame. There is also a little foreshadowing with Izzy's sacrificing animals in public at that to make a living. This is something we see later in the film with chickens. We move to Bo, that the film makes it important to note that she is Baptist, and it's not just a subtle reference to religion or a joke between a hocus-pocus occultist and a Protestant. We see a Baptist in water. It won't be the last time. Have you wondered why the distance between Angel and Bo? Normally someone would turn around at least, but Bo keeps her back and her distance from Angel. Pay attention how Angel keeps backing away from her. Symbolically, it's more than just trying to keep his feet dry. He's distancing himself from religion, or maybe it's distancing itself from him. Bo serenades Harry with a Johnny Favorite tune as he walks away. The song mocks him. Harry Angel can't escape the memories of Johnny Favorite. Before we get into the details found in the script, but not in the film, like, share, or subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this one. The film's Coney Island scene was very faithful to the original draft of the script. Izzy and Bo follow the screenplay almost word by word. However, it does leave out a couple of scenes. After the shot underneath the boardwalk with its gnawing rats, it cuts away to an interior shot of a woman dead lying on bed sheets splattered with blood. A fat man stares at her from above with his pale gray eyes filled with fear and frozen in time. The next scene would have revealed Harry Angel had walked into a wax museum with many figures in violent poses including the wax figure of Fatty Arbuckle over the figure of Virginia Rappe. Links below for those unfamiliar with both. Harry asks the arcade man where he can find Madame Zora's pitch. The arcade man sends him to Izzy. The arcade man would be briefly mentioned in the film when Angel approaches Izzy on the beach. Let me know in the comments below what did you find interesting from the Coney Island scene. Would you have preferred to see the Wax Museum, or was it creepy enough without it? This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, Don't be a gazoony. Keep your best shoes out of the ocean. As you know what today, today is? Today is Wednesday. It's anything can happen day. In this essay, we will look at the timeline of events in Angel Heart. As the chronology is essentially impossible, and this speaks to the possibility of time itself being manipulated by sinister forces. The conceit of the film is that Harry is interrogating witnesses to Johnny's misdeeds, and then Harry transforms into Johnny and murders them in order to stop them from revealing anything further. Let's consider an important question. Why doesn't Johnny kill these fonts of incriminating information before Harry interrogates them? If Johnny is a second personality in Harry's body, and the Johnny personality is aware of the thoughts and deeds of the Harry personality, then it makes more sense to kill the witness in advance, as Johnny would have the capacity to do so. Johnny isn't stopping Harry's investigation. He's leaving Harry with just enough information to keep going. Why is that? Well, let's assume that the murderer, Johnny, the devil, or whoever, has the capacity to reset time. It would benefit them to allow the interrogation in order to learn what the witnesses is willing to reveal, and then retroactively murder them prior to the investigation. If that sounds crazy, remember that the woman in black seems to have the power to undo events, and the theme of altering the past by altering records is very strong. But now, let's look at the biggest clue from the filmmakers that time is repeating. Fan service. Many essayists and vloggers, including this channel, determined that fans broadly represent evil. Alan Parker admits to this, stating that 
the literal blades of the fan bring to mind a guillotine, or executioner's axe. Parker leaves it there, but is there more? It has been asserted that the fans increase in speed when evil Johnny becomes dominant, that the fans are moving clockwise when Harry is in control, and counterclockwise when Johnny is in control. This latter explanation is supported by other videos on this channel, who examines the scenes where the fan is seen in a mirror and appears to be spinning counterclockwise. However, what does account for times when the fan appears to be spinning counterclockwise? Because our vantage point has changed, including when we see only the shadow of a fan. The explanation that is consistent throughout the film is that the fan slows down before a murder. When Harry leaves Dr. Fowler locked in his bedroom, the fan in the Fowler house slows down and changes direction just when Harry is leaving, exactly when the murderer would be emerging. Later in New Orleans, the fan in Toot Sweet's apartment stops at the moment that the murder would be happening. This creates an interesting question. Is the fan stopping and reversing direction, or is time? It seems that all spinning, clockwise machines in Angel Heart are metaphorical clocks. The Wonder Wheel Ferris Wheel at Coney Island has stopped turning, as figures inhabiting that world seem metaphorically stuck in time. Let's look at a cut at 03525 that seems designed by the filmmaker to explain the fan. The spinning fan does a graphic match to a receiving reel of Harry's audio tape recorder. The tape recorder can play events forward and backward, but it also allows you to rewind, re-record, and alter the record of events. Harry does exactly this. The pretense of the tape deck is that Harry is delivering audio recordings to Cypher as a way of reporting his progress, which is rather silly since writing a letter or making a phone call would be more practical. In other words, I think that the tape deck's presence as a symbol is its primary purpose. The premise that he is making audio recordings for Cypher is just an excuse to get the literal plot device into the movie. Harry removes a part of his report as he thinks Cypher should remain ignorant of its contents. Harry doesn't know that the devil has been doing the same thing to him. Trap Doors If the devil was reversing time in order to redo events, you might think that we would actually see history reset itself, see a scene reverse in time. Well, we do. Even though everyone he interrogates dies, Harry figures he's due for some good luck and interrogates Ethan Kruzmark. Someone tosses Ethan into a giant pot of gumbo, a medieval witch's cauldron organically placed in a modern setting. When Ethan Kruzmark invites Harry into his ad hoc meeting room, he opens the unlocked door closet to the building entrance. We'll call it door number one. At that moment, Harry drops a crab into the gumbo for no reason. It seems like a callous act, as if evil is emerging at this time, but then doesn't. At that moment, door number one is open and unlocked. However, Harry enters the meeting room and then closes and locks the door. There is a second door, door number two, that is also closed and locked. The second door leads to a hallway and a bathroom. When Harry is so upset that he needs to vomit, he unlocks door number two and runs to the bathroom. Now, don't lose the thread. This is not the door to the bathroom, but rather the door to the door to the bathroom. The door to the bathroom doesn't factor into this, a merciful simplification. At about the time the story would rewind, Ethan, still in the meeting room, sees something off screen that terrifies him, and then he goes silent. Then door number two closes and locks. We can assume that the wind didn't do this. The sinister forces at work needed to reset the scene to where it was a few minutes ago. We know that the door is locked because Harry runs back into the meeting room and he cannot open the door. This forces him to go down the hall and return to the building entrance where he finds that Kruzmark has been murdered. But also, door number one is open, reset to the state it was when the murder could or should have happened. Did the murderer of Ethan Kruzmark drag his body to the gumbo? 
It actually makes more sense that someone would have quickly killed him when he was right by the pot. And he was when Harry threw the crab into the pot. Expiration date. The first Johnny murder is that of Dr. Fowler. Harry breaks into Fowler's house, and before Fowler returns, Harry checks the refrigerator to find a bottle of milk and vials of morphine. He takes the time to check that the vial of morphine closest to the door is full and unopened. Presumably, Harry is confirming that Dr. Fowler hasn't had his fix yet and is calculating his strategy based on that. If that seems strange, during the aggressive interrogation, Harry pours himself a glass of milk, a conspicuous subversion of the hard-drinking private eye trope. If you always thought that was so strange as to be some sort of clue, then I have some good news for you. After Harry first confronts Dr. Fowler, he walks down the street and sees a church. This is likely a dream sequence, since the elevator is visible, and I do not think that the elevator is supposed to literally exist. But the important thing is that Harry sees the bowl that the woman in black had. The brush is gone, the woman is gone, but the bowl is still there and is gathering rainwater, as it will later in Harry's hotel room. The implication is that, since a murder is going to be added to and not subtracted from to the story, the woman in black is not needed. When Harry returns, he goes to the fridge before he goes to Dr. Fowler. Since Harry had previously stopped Fowler from getting morphine and then poured himself a glass of milk, we can expect the milk bottle to be reduced in volume and the morphine vial to be the same. However, the milk bottle has the same amount of milk and one of the morphine bottles has been reduced in volume. If Harry had never arrived, he would never have the milk, but Dr. Fowler would have consumed morphine. That is the condition of the fridge, and we can start to see that. This is not Harry arriving the second time, but Harry arriving the first time in a different timeline. The murderer has killed Fowler, retroactively, before the interrogation. Note that the fan reverses direction right when the time would have to go backward, and Harry's vision of the satanic church happens right when the murder would have happened. A week, you say? Yeah, at most. I need it for about a week. Now let's look at the biggest and most significant jump in time. It's Wednesday. It's anything can happen day, says Harry to police detective Deimos, per Taylor Vince. This is a popular catchphrase from Disney's original kids show, The Mickey Mouse Club. And with his TV viewing habits, bubblegum addiction, and milk swigging, I wonder if there is a purposeful motif of Harry being childlike. This is a very strange line, and it seems weird that a character would conspicuously mention that it's Wednesday. However, on this Wednesday, Harry is going to check in on Margaret Cruzmark to see if she's okay. She's not. The original meeting between Harry and Margaret also took place on a Wednesday. Is it a week later? If Jekyll and Hyde Johnny killed Margaret as we would assume, he couldn't have done it after the initial meeting, as with Father and Sweet. Since her body is fresh, the sequence must have been this. Harry meets with Margaret on Wednesday. Six days later, Johnny murders Margaret while Harry has his dream about the woman in black and an electric chair. And then, at around noon on Wednesday, Harry wakes up and discovers Margaret's body at 2 p.m., the time on the clock. Since the vision of the woman in black and the execution is clearly a dream and the visions of the church in upstate New York are also a dream, the rules are consistent. Harry has a bad dream while Johnny is in the driver's seat. But why did Johnny wait a week to kill Margaret? If Johnny is not the murderer, then we still have the question of why there is a week delay. Let's look at how time is represented in regard to Margaret. When the initial meeting happens, it is 4.30 p.m., and Harry has been waiting since 4 p.m. There was confusion over the time of the meeting as Johnny had a bad line. We never find out if Harry was waiting on the landing downstairs or whatever. It's just weird that there is this minor scheduling confusion taking up time in a movie about cosmic concepts. When Johnny removes all evidence of his presence at Margaret's apartment, he rips out the page of her schedule showing his appointment on Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. It's as if Harry made the appointment for 4.30 p.m. 
and the time of the appointment retroactively goes backwards as time goes forward. Even stranger, this is a notebook made into a calendar by marking the new day every day, and there is no time marked after the Wednesday meeting with Harry. So the calendar refers not to last Wednesday, but to today, the Wednesday that Johnny is reading it. Remember, the body is so fresh that Johnny could easily have murdered her at 1.30 p.m. on that Wednesday. This is all so bizarre that it actually makes more sense to assume that there is only one Wednesday. Johnny finds the body two and a half hours before his meeting with Margaret, which now retroactively never happens. Harry lives that same Wednesday twice. He gets the information from Margaret, then someone kills Margaret before the meeting, and Harry goes to the apartment for the first time, a second time. Do by chance remember the name Johnny Favorite? Timeline. Looking at our fracture timeline, we can see that on at least three occasions, the movie rewinds and redoes a scene, but why? Honestly, we don't know. It doesn't fit the surface text that Johnny is the murderer, and it doesn't fit the theory that Johnny doesn't exist. Perhaps, as stuff got rewritten and cut down in post, we end up with this vestigial mystery. Or maybe, the filmmakers have left behind clues about an even bigger mystery. I'd bet that the former is more likely than the latter. Angel Heart is a story of all-powerful evil, so parsing exactly what powers the devil exercises is academic. Please consider to like, share, or subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Make sure to catch part one of Angel Heart Explained on channel Hammered Out. You'll find the link below in the description. This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, Horoscopes don't do much good when you're out of time. The Lady in Black is a haunting figure that takes many forms in Harry Angel's investigation into the disappearance of Johnny Favorite. Angel sees her in different cities, in different churches and missions, outside and inside his head. But who is she? What does she symbolize? Who is under the veil? The answers are in the film and in the script too. There are metaphors, what we are led to believe, explicit tells, what we are told to believe, and fan fiction, what we want to believe. In this video, I'll mix all three and discuss the appearance of this mysterious and ghostly figure and share a little said theory of who is the Lady in Black. Angel Heart was released in 1987, written and directed by Alan Parker, and based on the novel Falling Angel by William Schwartzberg. The first appearance of the Lady in Black comes in the first act, inside the Kingdom Mission. Grabbing Harry Angel's attention, a blood-splattered wall is tended to by who we may first think is a fellow parishioner. After all, like many of the other ladies in the mission, she's dressed in black and wears a hat. However, her outfit is distinctive, her face purposely hidden, her style of hat much different, and seems to be wearing a shroud. With a lone chair to her left, she holds a brush in her right hand, her left hand is hidden. On the floor is a porcelain bowl filled with blood and water. Streaks of blood run down the wall. The lady in black kneels in front of a metaphoric mirror. The script simply describes the lady as a woman. No description of her wardrobe or hint who she may be. Do we see her through the eyes of Angel? Does Winesap see a different woman? In between visits to Dr. Fowler, Angel walks past the Salvation Church, described as dilapidated. He hears voices and heavy heartbeats. He steps inside the church where two missionaries sit patiently and wait. Harry sees a vision of a lone chair, a blood-filled porcelain bowl, and an elevator gate opening. The bowl and the lone unseated chair make their significance. The second appearance of the Lady in Black comes when Angel visits the Harlem mission a second time. It is not explicitly explained why he returns. It's a long way uptown. But the room with the red window draws him near. 
the evidence of blood wiped clean, leaving behind only a sterile bowl and its brush left on the floor. Angel climbs down to the floor of the pulpit. He sees and approaches the lady, but this time takes a seat facing a stage, a raised platform. The woman draws Harry in, just as the room had. He's afraid, but curious. Something inside of him wants to see her face. Just as he put his hand on her shoulder, he is attacked by two heavies. The lady in black stays seated. She is only seen in one other cut, oblivious of the scuffle behind her. Was this a haunting? Her next appearance comes with a flashback when Connie shared her newspaper's research into Johnny Favorite. Harry's mind drifts and experiences visions of a lady in black climbing a spiral staircase, carrying a clean white bowl with a brush inside. The stairwell looks illogical, twisting infinitely. The short scene cuts to the lady's shoes, and she takes a seat into a chair, sitting patiently and waiting. After Angel visits Tootsuite in his home, where he stuffs his phone number into his mouth. Harry drifts into a dream, another vision. His shirt is soaked in blood. That too may be part of a dream, or very real. The dream begins with an opening of a mysterious elevator gate, and Harry stumbles into an ambiguous room. To get there, he had taken the stairs upwards. Very curious, if he was wanting to leave Tootsuite behind, he would have made his way down. The room he comes across is large, resembling a makeshift church, complete with pews and a stage. There, the lady in black sits alone in the front bench, staring at a chair on a raised platform. As the elevator descends without him, Harry steps closer to the woman, but is distracted by a bloodied razor on the floor. His hand bleeds. His shirt is soaked in blood. There is another close shot of the lady, unmoved, uncaring, undisturbed. Angel steps closer, almost hesitant to touch her, but finally does. He is awakened by the police, and his vision ends. The oyster bar is where Harry wanted to contact Margaret Cruzmark a second time. In the phone booth, he has visions perhaps memories of New Year's Eve of 1943 and sees a red window and a soldier being approached with a hand coming to rest on his shoulders. An angel seen with epiphany during the indoor rainfall, angel has visions of hell as red rain falls. It fills the porcelain bowls in the room. Visions of the lady in black sitting patiently in her chair continue. We see the heels of her boots this is followed by what appears to be a man wearing wingtips stepping into the hallway. He is followed by two others. We see someone in high heels, escorted closely by another in men's shoes. We cut to the woman in black, wiping the blood-stained walls by candlelight, next to a chair with a clean white bowl resting on it. The candles rest on a sacrificial table next to a fan, the fan inside the hotel room. What we see when Harry was in the room with Epiphany is explained by Ethan Cruzmark that Johnny and Toot Sweet picked up a young man at Times Square where in Johnny's hotel room a ceremony was held where Margaret handed Johnny the sacrificial dagger. Johnny, Margaret, Toot Sweet, and one other make up the group of four. But the scene adds a few extra frames to the one where the lady in black is seated in the hallway. After the three walk out, the lady in black walks into the room to clean up the mess, to clean up the sacrifice. We then see one extra flashback where a group of three descend the spiral staircase, leaving the fourth behind. We see Johnny Favorite as the dark-haired man arm in arm with a blonde woman in heels who is Margaret Cruzmark. The other man is Toot Sweet. How do we know this? By the limp he carries down the stairs. In earlier scenes, set in 1955, we see Toots walk with a definite limp in his gait.
the figure in black makes one last appearance when Harry Angel retreats from Margaret's apartment and his conversation with Louis Cipher, a.k.a. the devil. He makes his way back to the room by a balcony where the figure in black sits in a chair carrying a white bowl collecting rainwater. When Angel approaches her, he steps to the left, acknowledging the figure is not imaginary, at least not in his mind. But when he passes the figure, the veil disappears. Before we reveal the face of the lady in black and give other theories, like, share, or subscribe if you enjoy this content and want to see more like this one. First, we go over who was real and who was imaginary. The woman sitting alone in the pulpit of the Kingdom Mission, she's imaginary, a specter, a ghost. The woman sitting alone in the pews in Toot's sweet apartment building, theory one, it's a dream because Harry Angel was going the wrong direction. His dream put together set pieces pulled from his recent memories, including the raised chair. The second theory is he wandered into the room when he was still under the devil's trance. The room is real resembling the inner sanctum of the kingdom mission. But the woman is another specter, a ghost, but a ghost of who? Then we come to the woman cleaning the wall inside the kingdom mission. She is real. Theory number one, there is nothing supernatural. Angel and Winesap see the woman dressed as we see her. Like the other prisoners, she's dressed in black during sermon day, but chose a wardrobe too close to home for Harry Angel. In other words, it's just a coincidence. The second theory, while Winesap may see the woman dressed more akin to the others, Angel sees her dressed like the one who cleaned up the bloodied wall at Favorite's hotel room 12 years earlier. It's a waking hallucination and the first clue of blending memories from present day reality. The third theory, there is nothing supernatural, but her dress is not coincidental. It is revealed later that Pastor John is a practitioner of the occult. This is made more explicit in the script. Could it be like Johnny Favorite has his most devoted follower, his minion? We are never told the details of the death. Was it self-served or was it a human sacrifice to continue Pastor John's business successes? The theory of minions surfaces and who was cleaning the wall in Favorite's hotel room after the sacrificial ritual. The script does not mention the flashbacks in such detail as the film. Only Ethan Cruzmark's narration, which was almost verbatim, played in inferred chronological order. The lady in black climbs the stair with a clean empty bowl and brush. She sits and waits patiently in the hall. A splatter of blood. Johnny Favorite, Margaret, and Toot Sweet walk out. The Lady in Black steps inside the room. The three conspirators exit by descending the winding staircase. The Lady in Black cleans up the mess left behind. Next to a sacrificial table, a raised platform where incantations, prayers were spoken. Who are the suspects who could have been the Lady in Black? It was never explained how Ethan Cruzmark was able to describe the ritual in such detail. Maybe it was him waiting outside. No, that would be ridiculous and unbecoming of a southern gentleman. Maybe the man descending the staircase was Ethan Cruzmark, and it was Toot Sweet dressed in black. No, that would be ridiculous and unbecoming of a jazz musician. The figure in black didn't walk in a limp anyway. We come back to the anonymous minion of Johnny Favorite. What a terrible job to be given to clean up a murder scene, not to mention the body. But I have another more provoking theory. There is one other associate of Favorite who hung out with him in 1943 New York. That would be Evangeline Proudfoot, dressed in disguise, hiding from the prying eyes of Margaret Cruzmark. In other words, Epiphany, she quotes her mother, describing Favorite as the closest to evil as she would ever want to be. I think sticking around a human sacrifice qualifies that. Evangeline is also at least an acquaintance of Tootsuit, as both practice their brand of voodoo, or obia. After Favorite called off his engagement with Margaret, he sent Evangeline south to New Orleans. 
but never returned after the war. Evangeline waited, and Evangeline died. The clue here is she waits patiently. Like the lady in black in front of the pulpit in the Kingdom Mission, like the lady in black in front of the stage in or near Tut Sweet's apartment building, the specter that Angel saw was his lost love, Evangeline. Now we come to the final reveal, the face of the lady or the figure in black, from shrouded to bare face. We see a clean-shaven man, played by actor Robert De Niro. But who is the character? Many will jump to think that this is Louis Cipher, the devil, with his beard shaven. But I will share my theory that's more controversial and maybe not heard in many places or anywhere. This is the ghost of Harry Angel. This is the face of Louis Cipher, who have taken the appearance of Harry Angel, but with a beard. This is why Cipher says, Funny, I have a feeling I've met you before. Like his name is a pun. Harry Angel meets Lucifer, as did Johnny Favorite. More clues come when Ethan Cruzmark tries to answer who was the soldier. Favorite and Tud Sweet picked up in Times Square. We see a young man turn to the camera. Before we see his face, we cut to Louis Cipher shaking hands with Harry Angel Imposter. Note we don't see Mickey Rourke's face. Both of these cuts represent an introduction, a meeting of hand to body. Johnny Liebling meets Harry Angel. Johnny Liebling meets the bearded likeness of Harry Angel. Lucifer shows he has the ability to be at different places almost instantaneously. It's played in a literal manner as he shows up in New Orleans for a speaking engagement in Baton Rouge. But does he possess the power to change shapes? Cypher offers the imposter angel to take the form in cloven hooves and a pointed tail. If you're asking, why couldn't the man in black be the devil without the beard? Because Lucifer was in Angel's hotel room in the shape of Epiphany's young son. The big tail or the glowing eyes, the accusatory pointed finger. The Lucifer boy shape is who killed Epiphany after Cypher had taken Angel's gun and dog tags. The soldier had waited for his soul to return to him since New Year's Eve, 1943. Let me know in the comments below, what are your theories about the Lady in Black? This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, if two jazz musicians walk up to you on New Year's Eve, just walk away. Mirrors betrayed Harry Angel. His reflection would no more hide the man he was inside. The silver glass portraits found in nearly every home, hotel room, and phone booth looked back at him, ready to take him home. In this video, we explore appearances of the mirror, where they were, and any possible symbolisms, including a very hard to notice clue into Harry Angel's soul that is only seen in his mirror. Angel Heart was released in 1987, written and directed by Alan Parker, and based on the novel Falling Angel by William Jortsberg. The first time we see a mirror is inside Dr. Fowler's bathroom. Harry Angel closes the medicine cabinet. His reflection stares back at him. But he visibly shows discomfort looking at himself. His eyes shift away. It's as if the soul inside of him doesn't like what it sees. Inside Spider Simpson's retirement home, a mirror is placed in the far corner of the room where souls rest and wither. Mysteriously, there is a fan on the opposite side. Angel and Simpson rest in between them. The mirror has no one's reflection to frame inside of it. The fan, unpowered. The mystical energies are not illustrated here. Both the mirror and the fan wait for their turn to come to life in a place waiting for death. Just arrived in New Orleans, Harry Angel dresses in grooms, ready for a night at the club, investigating. 
Angel turned to face the mirror. Did he have the courage to look into it? We will never know. He tried to avoid them so far. Perhaps the next opportunity will give better insight. Unwilling to give Toots Sweet a break, Angel follows Toots into the men's room. From one angle, Angel willingly looks at himself in the mirror. Is this a break in character? No, there is no mirror. There is only a frame. Neither Angel nor Toots cast a reflection. Angel tries to behave calmly, but we see it's just an act like the act of looking comfortable in front of a mirror, which he never does. Having enough of Toots' secrets, Harry jumps him in Toots' apartment. In their struggle, they bump into a dresser, where a mirror stands over them, watching them fight. An inoperable table fan is seen so briefly it's easily overlooked. It falls, waiting for Toots to join it on the floor. We know the mirror was looking over Angel's shoulder when Toots was choked out of life. The detectives, Stern and Deimos, investigate Harry Angel by helping themselves into his room. There are mirrors everywhere, but none with the reflection of Angel. The policemen are in the mirror, doubling their presence, so to speak. If the walls are not yet closing in on Harry Angel, the mirrors are, as a porcelain bowl rests and waits on his bed. The mirror behind the bar rests underneath a collection of animal trophies, a collection of death, bodies stuffed as sacrifices to the sin of vanity. Angel walks to the phone booth underneath twirling fans. Like Angel's call to Madame Cruzmark, he has walked into a dead end. A mirror inside the phone booth, its reflection stares back at him. Angel has an out-of-body experience, recalling memories that may or may not have been his. Does this experience, this moment of confusion, transform Harry Angel into a different man? After discovering Margaret's body, seeing her heart had been ripped out, Angel seeks solace in a bar with a glass of scotch. He is shadowed by both a fan and a large mirror. The fan twists both clockwise and counterclockwise, depending if you look into the mirror's reflection or not. Here Angel may wonder if it was Johnny Favorite who murdered Toots and Margaret. Does the mirror's reflection know who is real and who is false? Followed in his car, Angel is seen looking into his rear view mirror. He is not looking at himself, but he does call for the mirror's help. Help to escape. Very interesting that Angel's wearing glasses to help disguise himself from the mirror looking back and judging him harshly. Epiphany visits Angel at his room. They talk, have drinks, and dance. The image of Epiphany, a reflection, is caught in the mirror. She sits in the exact spot the bowl was earlier. After Angel and Epiphany conclude their romantic experience, complete with hellish hallucinations, and a clairvoyant vision of Winesap's accident. Angel punches the mirror after looking at himself. His outrage is considerably cathartic or vengeful, something Johnny Favorite would do if he would ever discover what Angel had done with his daughter. After Detective Stern paid a second visit, Angel looked at himself in the cracked mirror again. Is his soul broken? While he did stare into his eyes, his eyes looked away. 
Harry Angel confronts Ethan Cruzmark, demanding answers, demanding what happened to Johnny Favorite. But Ethan Cruzmark's explanation descends into his history of black magic and Favorite's diabolical plan to outwit the Prince of Darkness. Angel is told a young soldier was sacrificed on New Year's Eve 1943. He does not want to believe. At first he is angry, then in denial, but he soon begins asking more questions. He is sickened as the truth is just out of his reach. Angel stares at himself into the mirror and sees images. Times Square, the bearded likeness of Louis Cipher, the lady in black. Favorite, Margaret and Toots descending the hotel spiral staircase, the sacrificial table. Angel screams into the mirror. Do we hear his voice or the voice of the sacrificed? In search for the vase of secrets, Angel races through Margaret's home. Mirrors are everywhere now. He finds the vase. The dog tags. The name. Harry Angel is Johnny Favorite. Enter Louis Cipher. Lucifer. The man with the dime store joke. Lectures Angel, who, for twelve years, lived another man's life. Angel stares into the large mirror and sees Favorite stare back. The flashbacks return. They are more vivid, more convincing. In Favorite's rampage, he murders both Fowler and Margaret in front of mirrors where mirrors were not seen before. The mirror does more than reveal Angel's past. It sneaks into Epiphany's future. Cypher's reflection is seen standing up and out of the room leaving Angel, leaving Favorite, alone, because Cypher has other things to do. Angel returns to his room and finds the detectives inside. The glass where Angel punched the mirror is gone. Looking at Epiphany's corpse, Angel poses in front of the mirror near the door. He cannot escape them. Meanwhile, the other mirror has Epiphany in its sight. She too is captured in the hell. Johnny Favorite will burn in. Mirrors were everywhere in the end of the film. Nowhere early. Until Angel broke into Father's house. But were there subtle hints of distorted reflections? Untrue to the image? There might have been inside the Sarah Dodd Memorial Clinic in Poughkeepsie. Angel approaches the front desk, unable to see through the window. From the other side, however, it appears he's looking at himself in a one-way mirror. In irony, Angel uses a false identity. Angel poses through the open window in the middle of panels of reflections. He's the living reflection, living a lie. Before we get to the final secret of mirrors, like, share, or subscribe if you enjoyed this video and want to see more content like this one. Taking a bath, Epiphany sings a very familiar tune. It's a Johnny favorite tune that seems to disturb Angel. He returns to the mirror and looks at himself. Through the cracks, is that a tear running down Angel's face? Something is very wrong, isn't there? Let me know in the comments below what do you see in the mirrors? This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, when you check out of a hotel, don't bust the furnishings or leave a body. Fans, the kind that run on electric, twist with the wind of souls throughout the film. They are foreboding symbols of death and alternate realities, crossing between worlds of the living and the supernatural. In this video, we review every appearance of them, including one or two other theories about the Twisted fans. Angel Heart was released in 1987, written and directed by Alan Parker, and based on the novel Falling Angel by William Schwartzberg. The first appearance of an electric fan is seen in the Kingdom Mission, 
It has not power to cool the congregation in a crowded room, each dressed in black, but it is January. The next appearance is a very brief one. Winesap escorts Angel to the inner sanctum where he meets Louis Cipher. There is a very quick cut of dual fans. One is powered, the other is apparently not. It may represent two realities, two identities, one similar to the other, but they are not the same. The second of the two fans spins like the other, but it is a facsimile, a pretender, as it does not have the energy to continue. The next appearance is at the Sarah Dodds Harvest Memorial Clinic in the nurse's office. It is seen in the background, sharing cabinet space with religious displays. It too is unpowered, not cooling the staff dressed in white. We have separate appearances where fans are unimportant set props that may be seen anywhere from a religious sermon where no obvious traditional decorations are seen to a facility of medicine and science where decorations are present. Fans cool both those who are black and white, wardrobe speaking. The next fan we see is in Dr. Fowler's bedroom. While the fan is not electrified, it turns clockwise, powered by karma, when Harry Angel brings the doctor into his room. Harry Angel's visit to the doctor's soon-to-be deathbed begins to bend reality. We see the fan change directions and twists counterclockwise. Harry locks the doctor in his room. We see the shadows of the fan blades. They twist back and forth over a mismatched pair of shoes. Does the fan represent two different realities playing over each other? This cut repeats after Harry returns from the diner and discovers the body of Dr. Fowler. Does the two cuts of the shadows over shoes represent before and after Dr. Fowler's demise, or does it represent one timeline shown to the audience twice? Next, is the Italian cafe where Angel meets Cypher. Angel adjusts his belt and poses underneath a powered fan. This is unusual in a couple ways. First, it's still January in an empty room on a street level business near a glass door. Second, with Cypher in the room, it appears the spiritual energy is too strong. The blades move only one direction and may not even been switched on. The following appearance of the fan is easy to overlook and miss, where Angel returns to Pastor John's inner sanctum. We see the blades turn behind Angel's back. It's air pushing him to open the mysterious cabinet of secrets. We see the inactive fan in the pulpit again, when Harry sees the lady in black sit alone in the second row. Unlike the upstairs fan, powered with no one to enjoy its breeze, this fan is not powered. Or another way to describe it, the fan is dead. Could there be a relationship? Up next is Angel's Daydream, where he shares a moment alone with Connie as she tells him about her research into Johnny Favorite. Angel has distant memories, including the fan in the walls of a New York hotel underneath a red window. The blades spin quickly to sounds of a human scream. We do not know if it is powered by electric or other unnatural forces. We do see the fan blades from the inside the room, as we, the audience, begin to get inside Angel's head. The turning blades cut to a tape player in an editing technique called a graphic match. Harry Angel narrates his visit to see Spider Simpson. His retirement home showcases a fan standing in the corner. Again, it's an everyday set piece, unpowered in the month of January in a room of freezing elderly. It's 10.30 p.m. and a ceiling fan cools the patrons at the Red Rooster where Angel first meets Toots Sweet. Angel waits for Toots to walk past him as Toots heads for the bar. Notice how Angel lights a cigarette in his preparation of a stage act. 
The fan is positioned to the far left, angel in the middle, toots to our right. Do the blades represent propelling their fates to play out? To continue, there is no stopping it, and Harry is tossed out five minutes later. Much later, Angel confronts Toots in his apartment after witnessing his OBS ceremony. It is a brief yet violent confrontation. Angel stuffs his number into Toots's mouth and walks off. We hear the distant voice of Toots singing his requiem to a squeaking fan energized by Toots' sweet soul fleeting from his body. Up next is the Oyster Bar, where the theme of the place is trophy kills. They are on display high on the walls. Angel makes his way to the phone booth to call Madame Cruzmark. The fans above him are powered, its speed set to low. They pave his way to the phone, where Margaret, on the other end of the call, is unable to answer. Angel has visions again inside the phone booth of a fan below a red window. The bar and fans represent death. Harry Angel discovers the murdered body of Margaret Cruzmark and tries to emotionally recover with a drink at a local bar. We hear both the piano keys playing Girl of My Dreams and the squeaks of a fan before a close-up is followed by a mid-shot showing both Harry and the fan above him the fan is seen spinning clockwise and counterclockwise, depending if you look into the mirror or not. Karma from two spiritual realities power the blades. Because the reflection we see is a true mirror image, it's becoming more difficult to discern which one is real and which one is not. In a Catholic church, Harry Angel meets Louis Cipher to give him updates on his search for Johnny Favorite, as grim as the news is. In the background, there are at least two fans mounted on the pillars. They are immobile, their blades frozen. The fans peer over its pews with the duty overseeing the followers. They move neither for an angel or a devil. Does it mean the fans have no power here? Or does it show that Cypher's supernatural energy has no influence? He sits in the seats, taunting, testing, waiting. When Epiphany visits Harry at his room, they dance and begin an interlude that intertwines visions that may or may not been in Harry's mind. The images are quick, nightmarish, hell in origin, the symbolism may flash in front of our eyes, but the vision of a fan is now associated with blood and sacrifice. The blades spin, they cannot be stopped. Wine sap is shown in an extremely short cut, a snippet that reveals an unexpected moment. He is shadowed by a twisting fan, a very ominous symbol. We see other spinning blades. What do they mean? Many questions are answered by Ethan Kruzmark when he gives his narration of what happened on New Year's Eve 1943. We learn explicitly the fan is associated to a human sacrifice so Johnny Favorite can steal a soul. Harry Angel, with a terrible intuition, returns to Margaret Kruzmark's home and discovers he is Johnny Favorite. Mephistopheles, the devil, meets Favorite there, with a cane in his right hand that looks much different than the first. Louis Cipher plays one of Favorite's tunes on a turntable, and it spins clockwise like a fan. Seems Margaret had a spinning fortune-telling object in her home, after all. Before we get into a couple bonus theories about what twists in the wind, like, share, or subscribe if you want to see more content like this one. It does help grow the channel. When fans turn both clockwise and counter, we see two realities. One for Harry Angel, the other for Johnny Favorite. 
But fans are not the only things twisting. Harry Angel's tape recorder is also seen spinning in different directions. He is seen rewinding or re-recording, overriding his testimony, keeping favorite secret love of the Evangeline Proudfoot a secret. And like the fan blades, Angel spins two stories, two truths, one recorded and the other forever lost. What else is seen spinning with a hidden meaning? It comes very early in the film. We see Cypher's walking stick before we see his face. It turns patiently one way and the other. It is one of two canes Cypher carries. The symbolism of hell carried in his hand that opens the film is bookended when we see Johnny Favorite descend to the underworld by way of the elevator. The gears spin both clockwise and counterclockwise. When Harry reaches the lower levels of hell, his face looks much less of Angel and begins looking more like Johnny Favorite. Let me know in the comments below what meanings do you see in the fans? Did I miss any? This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, it's better to break bread with a friend than cracking an egg with the devil. When it comes to Angel Heart, one of the more peculiar scenes requested by viewers of the channel is where Harry Angel meets Louis Cipher in an Italian cafe. It's because of all the melodrama over some boiled eggs, but there's more to it than a pinch of salt. It's a scene that lasts less than four minutes. It's filled with clues of the future, most of all filled with superstition. We take a closer look where Harry met Cypher in what I call the egg scene. And make sure to like, share, or subscribe if you enjoy this content and want to see more videos like this one. Angel Heart was released in 1987, written and directed by Alan Parker, and based on the novel Falling Angel by William Jortsberg. We begin our exploration on the streets of New York with a moment that first appears unimportant. Harry Angel bumps into a young woman. They both recognize each other. It's a subtle message that Harry is well known in the neighborhood. This is not the first creating this illusion of a long established backstory. A man called out to him in his first appearance, again on the streets. We're told subliminally he's been deep into the neighborhood as long as anyone could remember. He's not just someone who just appeared out of nowhere, right? Next is the Italian cafe where Angel meets Cypher. Angel adjusts his belt and poses underneath a powered fan. This is unusual in a couple ways. First, it's still January in an empty room on a street level business near a glass door. Second, with Cypher in the room, it appears the spiritual energy is too strong. The blades move only one direction and may not even been switched on. Cypher is sitting at his table with a white tablecloth, drinking out of a white cup and surrounded by silver. There are glass salt and pepper shakers, but what takes the cake, or in this case, eggs, are the eggs, sitting in a bowl that more resembles a chalice or a grail. I also take amusement at the waiter in the background. He looks at Angel very curiously, as if he is expecting a second person to walk inside. One thing I noticed is Cypher is wearing the same tie, possibly the same outfit, worn in the Kingdom mission. His wardrobe is predictable. Black, white, a little silver, and some glass. Included is his ring. A piece of jewelry seen on Fowler, Toots, and Margaret Cruzmark. Angel's meeting with Cypher in the restaurant in a way pays homage to the source material. In William Jortsberg's Falling Angel, a restaurant is where the private detective first meets his client. The book made New York City the heart of its story, mentioning many buildings, places, and streets. Restaurants and bars were frequented often, and Alan Parker continued that theme in the film. 
Cypher's meal consists of eggs, boiled eggs, with an almost religious presentation. He crushes them under the palm of his hand, making the sounds of cracking bones. Cypher peels its shell, the outer layer that physically defines its shape, its existence. But like any who would devour it, wants what's inside. That is where the calories are, the energy, the essence. Perhaps this is why Cypher brings up that the egg is a symbol of the soul before he devours it. Could the three eggs represent the souls of others? Harry Angel refuses Cypher's egg. He turns down an offering of a soul. Instead, Angel resorts to his own superstition and throws spilled salt over his left shoulder. This practice of Western culture has biblical meaning. It's not merely to thwart bad luck, but to blind the devil who is sometimes known to try to persuade you over your left shoulder. Salt is also a metaphor for, and once upon a time was literally, money. The word salary originates from the Latin word for salt. Roman soldiers were paid in it, and why we sometimes say worth one salt. But Cypher is not concerned over the salt he blows. If salt is money, he will spill and blow it as much as he needs to get what he wants. He has an old-fashioned belief in honor. Like the salt he blows in the wind, he throws money at Angel to keep him on the case, helping Harry overlook a few inconveniences like the death of Dr. Fowler. Salt or money, it's all the same to him, just like the soul of a man or an egg. Now for some bonus trivia. The cafe business doesn't look very good, and I'm not sure how much profit there is in boiled eggs and a cup of espresso, but the waiter, or otherwise the only employee seen inside the Italian cafe, never bothered to check up on Angel or offer him a menu. Sure, it made sense cinematically to not interrupt the conversation between Rourke and De Niro with pointless distractions. However, I can't help but to think how eerie the restaurant scene looked otherwise. What should have been a casual conversation at the table becomes an epicenter of fear. Next is Cypher's choice of wardrobe in the cafe's motif. The look of bone white and black, silver and glass, is a carryover from the scene of Dr. Father's residence. His refrigerator is the motif's crescendo. Even the script describes the appliance as old. The refrigerator is full of white, silver glass imagery, including the glass bottles, milk, and other powders that resemble milk, and black ink printed on off-white labels. The refrigerator itself is made of white and stainless steel racks. The motif is seen well before Father's Kitchen. You'll see it in the bedroom, complete with wardrobe, Bible, and gun. It's before his bathroom, with the mirror, syringes, razor, and aspirin. We'll see it just outside his home, when Angel reaches for his flashlight, and marches through the ice and snow. It is a hint of things to come, he's starting on his path to self-discovery. We see, even though Angel left Father behind, the symbolism of danger and death followed him. Let me know in the comments below, what did you find most fascinating about the egg scene? This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, Cypher had boiled because deviled eggs were not on the menu. Dogs in Angel Heart make their appearances known to Harry Angel, and many of them just don't like what they see in him. Are they theatrical props? Or do they represent a deeper, more sinister meaning that may shake your very fears and insecurities? In this video, we explore every appearance of the canine, their importance and significance. But fair warning, it does come with a major spoiler for anyone who has not yet read the source material. Angel Heart was released in 1987 
written and directed by Alan Parker, and based on the novel Falling Angel by William Jortsberg. When Angel steps out of his car, prepared to break into Dr. Father's house, there are barking dogs heard in the background. They are calling for him, almost knowing what he was up to. It may seem coincidental, but nothing in film and sound editing are coincidental. Angel locks Fowler in his bedroom, hoping a nap of cold turkey will rekindle his memories of Johnny Favorite. Walking past a dilapidated church, his feet through the snow, the barking dogs have returned. They never left, still waiting, still taunting him. It's the spirits of dogs actively looking for him into the night. After a meeting over boiled eggs with Louis Cipher, Angel returns to the Kingdom Mission, discovers Pastor John's business secrets, bumps into the Lady in Black, and is attacked by heavies. He escapes outside, and the sounds of barking dogs return. Angel races across the street and interrupts the pastor's procession, and he races along a chain-linked fence where four dogs furiously yap at him. The chain-link fence is more like a window, separating Angel, keeping him safe from being torn apart. But now the dogs know who he is and what he looks like. Driving deeper into the bayou, Angel makes his way to Evangeline's grave. He takes a dirt road through rural Louisiana. From a distance, the dogs recognize Angel. Even leashed, they want to go after him. When Angel makes it to Evangeline's burial site, Epiphany comes to pay tribute. Harry hides. With the serene sounds of chirping birds, comes a subtle reminder of dogs again. When he is tempted to get too close to Epiphany, Angel steps into Epiphany's courtyard in his clever disguise. A canine leaps out at him. It startles Angel, and he runs out of its reach, the leash and chain gives. While other dogs bark and whine, this one seems to be on the attack. Further into the story, well past Angel's scuffle with Tut Sweet and his discovery of Margaret's heartbroken body, Angel is tailed by Ethan Cruzmark's hired men. His attempt to play another character out of his wallet doesn't work when a pit bull is released on Harry and grabs him by the leg. Harry can't fight it off and joins the crawfish in the water. Since these are Cruzmark's men, it's safe to assume this is Cruzmark's dog, and this fact is an important clue I'll reveal later. Angel walks through the town. Off camera comes the repeated barks of a dog, angry at Angel's presence. The barking annoys Harry, and he decides to confront Cruzmark's henchmen, still waiting for him to catch the next train. There's violence in the stables, and the pit bull is released just as the moment Angel is pinned underneath a horse. But a stroke of good luck saves Harold and Angel escapes through a tunnel filled with live chickens. Before we reveal the sad meaning of dogs, like, share, or subscribe if you enjoy this content and want to see more like this one. Most every frame in the film is an experience seen through Angel's eyes or otherwise with an earshot. One exception, debatable in its severity, where Angel and his car drives across New Orleans and catches the attention of a resident and, of course, her dogs. However, the biggest, most obvious is the film's opening, showcasing a devilish man with a cane, described in the script, whistling a familiar tune. We, the audience, hear as Girl of My Dreams by saxophone. What else do we see? A recent murder, a cat, but most of all, a dog. The film introduces a world with death everywhere and no hairy angel. Why would the dogs in Angel's world seem to know something he does not? The clues are found in Ethan Cruzmark's testimony. 
told to Angel describing the sacrificial ritual performed by Johnny Favorite. The victim, a young soldier, was bound naked on a rubber mat, a pentacle branded on his chest, and Johnny was handed a virgin dagger and sliced the victim clean open and woofed down his heart. While that and contents from a broken vase tells us things, the film never answered one curious question. Whatever happened to the victim's body? The source material, Falling Angel by Georgeberg, gives us this answer. When Angel confronts Cruzmark, the film is rather faithful to the book as far as dialogue and information shared to the reader. However, in the novel, Angel asked what happened to the body. Cruzmark answered, It was dismembered and fed to the dogs. Cruz marks dogs from one of his kennels. While the dialogue and the piece of trivia about Angel's body are omitted from the film, the dogs and the symbolisms remain as sad and depressing as it was. Let me know in the comments below, had you ever given thought about the dogs through the film, and would you think differently now the next time you watch Angel Heart? This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, Sometimes it's best to leave town on the next train. Water is everywhere. It is Angel Heart's most memorable motif. Most recognized in Angel's hotel room, where it rained passionate red. But water, in all its forms, is seen throughout the movie. Do they have something else in common? Perhaps hidden symbolism just waiting to float to the top? Regardless, we're going to examine every example of water. Angel Heart was released in 1987, written and directed by Alan Parker, and based on the novel Falling Angel by William Jortsberg. Angel Heart opens with the hellish images of ice and steam. The fire escapes make an appearance of an Escher painting, where the illogical becomes the in-universe norm. Then comes a dog, a scavenger, and harbinger of death. It's a premonition that comes literally true seconds later. Is this a world of hopelessness and despair? Such questions are answered when the devil himself makes an appearance. Water and blood are symbolically synonymous. As seen inside the Kingdom Mission, when Harry Angel looks into a small private room. One of Pastor John's flock, dressed in black, cleans up after a terrible tragedy. There is nothing pure here. On the trail of Dr. Fowler, Angel makes a visit to his residence in Poughkeepsie, New York. We see his feet dredge through snow as he begins his journey to self-discovery. This is more than a coincidence. After Angel locks the doctor in his bedroom, he spends time letting Fowler enjoy some cold turkey. He's outdoors again, his feet back into the snow. Like the opening credits, we hear dogs barking for him in the distant background. A visit to a dilapidated church reminds him he cannot escape the imagery of red water and elevator cars. Angel's search for Johnny Favorite takes him to Coney Island, and the water's there. He finds the sideshow performer Izzy, who directs him to his wife, Bo. That the film makes it important to note that she is Baptist. And it's not just a subtle reference to religion or a joke between a hocus-pocus occultist and a Protestant. We see a Baptist in water. It won't be the last time. Have you wondered why the distance between Angel and Bo? Normally someone would turn around at least, but Bo keeps her back and her distance from Angel. Pay attention how Angel keeps backing away from her. Symbolically, it's more than just trying to keep his feet dry. He's distancing himself from religion, or maybe it's distancing itself from him. Bo serenades Harry with a Johnny Favorite tune as he walks away. The song mocks him. Harry Angel can't escape the memories of Johnny Favorite. Cruise Mark is introduced outdoors waiting to hop on a trolley we get a glimpse of a mule-driven cart of ice. True, it's a nice period piece prop, and New Orleans is hot. But is this a foreshadow? It is not uncommon symbolizing death with ice. 
it is not the last time we see ice in the presence of a cruise mark. Are we given a hint about the cooling of food? Is there an association with this in Dr. Father's refrigerator? If you're not quite convinced, let's look at the chalkboard, listing eggs and ice cream. You'll find them in an ice box, and many varieties of eggs, dairy and ice cream are colored white, the color of bones. Ice is also a symbol for a cold personality. The next person we see in frame after given a flash of ice is Madame Cruzmark. The first downpour we see comes outside Mammy Carter's herb shop, where Harry is looking for answers and High John the Conqueror route. Mammy Carter doesn't see Harry as a customer as much as a poor soul who couldn't escape nature. Stern and Deimos first interview Angel over the poor fate of Toot Sweet. Deimos makes a comment about the leak in the room, though we don't see much yet. It foreshadows that things will get worse, much, much worse. After drinking himself to a stupor over the death of Margaret Cruzmark, we see a baptism over standing water. The characters have nothing to do with the story, yet conveys different emotions. From joy that could be equally interpreted as pain, to celebration, relief, piousness, and even boredom. But the waters that gave the baptized their salvation do not shield Angel. Cruise Mark's heavies forcefully hold Angel into the water, and little difference from the baptized, like them, is given a choice to submit or suffer the consequences. Water and blood both make equal appearances when Epiphany stays in Angel's hotel room. It is known as the Daymare, where haunting images of the occult, underworld, and sacrifice overshadow everything and everyone else. But was this the motif's finale? Was this the answer to the question, why the water? Bo and the Baptists were not the only ones seen in standing water. Epiphany takes a bath, and just like Bo, sings a Johnny favorite song. In a private conversation with Ethan Cruzmark, Angel gets the backstory behind Favorite's plan. Harry listens while chipping away at a block of ice, chipping away at the truth. But Harry becomes agitated and accusatory. He demands the truth but does not want to believe it. Praying to the porcelain god applies here, but it gets him nowhere other than lifting a new ingredient from the gumbo. Mother Nature, without mercy, downpours on the city as it drops uncomfortable truths on Angel. A broken canopic jar reveals the truth of Harry's past, the truth of Johnny Favorite's past. With the world crumbling around him, he has just one person left to care for. Angel races to his hotel room where Stern and Deimos wait for him. The rain brings more bad news. Death to Epiphany and the electric chair to Johnny Favorite. Before I discuss the final motif of water, like, share, or subscribe if you enjoyed this content and want to see more like this one. It only rains at specific times, did you notice? Present every time Angel is with Epiphany or talks about a subject close to her heart. It rains during his trip to Mammy Carter's when he asks about her mother, Evangeline. After bitten by dogs, Angel is soaked when he reunites with Epiphany. It rains when Epiphany waits for Angel outside his hotel room. It rains inside too. And it rains when he races to her from Margaret Cruzmark's. But what about when the first two met? when Angel asked about Evangeline and Favorite. While we didn't see rain, there was a shower. Let me know in the comments below, did you see something interesting in the motif of water? This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, when in New Orleans, try to enjoy the seafood. Check out other videos on my channel. Thanks for watching.